So, uh, I didn't mention earlier, today is Teresa and I's 18th anniversary. And I tell you what, I get the joy of spending my anniversary with my church family, praising and worshiping a God that shed His blood for me. What an anniversary gift this is. Wow, what a day this is. Can you feel the Holy Spirit filling this place? I never get tired of worshiping with my church family, and then I get the privilege of preaching God's Word on top of that. It doesn't get much better than this. Um, again, I'm excited to have all the folks, uh, Tim Drury and, and everybody from First Baptist Bethalto coming up here uh, to help us just share the love of Christ all over Canton, Illinois this week. What an opportunity we have here at Temple Baptist Church to be the hands and feet of Jesus right here where God has placed us this day. If that doesn't get you excited, then I don't know what would. Maybe a, a demolition derby last night at the fair, huh? I don't know. Or, or a fight with a bat or whatever. There's probably several things that would, uh, would excite you. But anyway, I'm excited today. Today I get to finish up my sermon series on what it means to live worthy of the gospel. Today we're in Philippians chapter 2. I'll uh, be, be picking up in verse 5. We'll go through, uh, through verse 11. Um, those of you that know me um, know that I, God has blessed Teresa and I in our 18 years uh, with four precious beloved children. Um, those of you that don't know uh, me yet or don't know my family, we have uh, four children, 16, uh, 12, I'm sorry, 17, thank you, Emily, uh, 17, 12, and uh, 6, and 3. Now, those of you that have raised children, uh, those of you that know what a three-year-old is like, aren't they just precious? Aren't they just amazing? I mean, every single one of them have gone through this stage, and now we're living it with little Caleb. And I tell you what, I mean, as Henri and as big of a stinker as he is sometimes, he's just the cutest little kid ever. Thank you very much, Grandma. Uh, but... <laughs> But anyway, uh, Caleb and most three-year-olds, they go through this stage um, where they ask the question, Why? Caleb loves tools. He loves tools and trucks and tractors and everything that has to do with that sort of stuff. And so inevitably, if I go out to the garage, boy, he is right there with me. And I'll pick up a wrench and, and Caleb will go, Daddy, da Daddy, what's that? And I'll say, well, well, that's a wrench. And he'll say, why? I'm like, well, because God made it a wrench. And say, well, well why do you need it, Daddy? Well, I got to tighten up a bolt. Well, Why? Well, because the bolt's loose, buddy, that's why. Well, well, why do you need to tighten it? Well, because that's the, the better way that it's designed to, to hold down whatever it's holding down. And he'll say, well, well, why, Daddy? And so I have to spend most of my time answering my cute, precious little three-year-old's questions as he asks, why? Now, it's fun, it's fun most of the time to explain to a, a dear little child why it is that something is the way it is, why the sky is blue, I mean, why the world is round, why, why, why. It's fun. Sometimes it's, it's overwhelming, isn't it? Sometimes we get asked questions that by, by a lost world that it's really difficult to answer. Why? Why does God let things happen? Why are all these things the way they are? Sometimes that question, why, is overwhelming. Well, today, as I wrap up this series on what it means to live worthy of the gospel, the first week we, we explored the end of chapter 1, and, and we, we looked at what it means to live worthy of the gospel, as Paul just slams us with that verse that says, oh yeah, by the way, one more thing, y'all are supposed to live your lives in a way that is worthy of the gospel. And we looked at what that really meant, and it means that we as the body of Christ would be unified here on this earth right now while we are here serving and glorifying Jesus. Then the next week as we explored what it means to live worthy of the gospel, we talked about what it looks like, how it really, really looks, and right here where the rubber meets the road, and that means each one of us being humble putting other people's needs ahead of our own, and what a monumental Christ-sized task that really is. Today we get to answer the question, why? Why would we even venture to try to live our lives in a way that is worthy of the gospel? Today we answer that question, why, as we explore one of the greatest passages in all of Scripture. Philippians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul writing this love letter to this dear little church in Philippi, this strong church that is doing great things for the kingdom of God. And Paul explains and answers for them and for all of us today and for all of eternity why it is 
that we should live worthy of the gospel. Paul writes, beginning in verse 5, he says, Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, boy, do we thank you for this time of worship and praise. Lord, I thank you for your word and for how it is spoken to to your creation for, for all of its existence. And Lord, I thank you for this message that you have given me. And oh, do I pray that your spirit will take it and preach it through me today, boldly and clearly. Father, I ask that you will open up our eyes and our hearts, that we may understand who you are, what you've done for us and then what we can do for you. Father, we pray all these things in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So today, as we answer the question, why live worthy of the gospel, we'll understand the truth that anyone can live worthy of the gospel by understanding several different truths that are buried here in this passage. We can all live worthy of the gospel because of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. The first thing that each one of us has to know and and understand um, about living worthy of the gospel and answering that that question of why do it? Why should should we even venture to do it? Number one, the first thing is because Jesus demonstrated it for us. Jesus demonstrated it. Look at verses 6 through 8. Paul's talking about uh, Jesus Christ, and he explains and describes what Jesus did as Jesus demonstrated for us this incredible truth. He says, Who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by by assuming the form of a slave and taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. Now, before we get into verses 6 through 8 and explore a little bit more about how, um, how Jesus demonstrated for us what it means to live worthy of the gospel, we have to not forget verse 5. Now, the Apostle Paul is really good at saying some things that uh, then should drive us and motivate us in other areas of our life. As we explored chapter 1, verse 27, when Paul hit us with that doozy and said, oh yeah, by the way, folks, one more thing, live worthy of the gospel, he then hits us again. He he hammers us here with another truth in verse 5. He's just reminding us that, that following Christ is about so much more than us, ourselves, and our own selfish desires. Paul just slams us with verse 5, and he says, make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty, pretty Christ-sized order that Paul gives us. I mean, he tells us to make our own attitude that of Jesus. I don't know about you, but that's, that's beyond my capabilities. That's beyond my own human understanding. Paul just slams us again. Wow, Paul, I can't wait to meet him. I mean, he's, he's quite a writer, isn't he? Okay, maybe not. I think he is. How about you? All right. He says, make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. And then he goes on and explains the attitude of Christ Jesus. Wow, that's that's big. Why should we live worthy of the gospel? Because Jesus demonstrated it for us. He explains right here, Paul does, what Christ did. All right, verse 6, he says, Who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for, for his own advantage. 
Wow. First thing we got to know is just, just stop for a second, back up, and understand two things, basically, that Jesus came for. Okay, I mean, we could spend months talking about all the reasons that Jesus came to the earth. But really, you can wrap it up into two things. Number one, Jesus came, well, first and foremost, ultimately, to be the Lamb of God, to do his atoning, redemptive work on the cross, to give his life as the once and for all perfect sacrifice for humanity's sins, so that all who put our faith and trust in him would be born again, forgiven, and experience eternal life, okay? That's the reason Jesus came. Thank you for that. That's the reason Jesus came. But he also came for a second very important reason, and that was to be our example. He came, God the flesh came down to the earth and lived a life that we could not live on our own to demonstrate for us what it means to follow him, to live that kind of a life. So, so Jesus came, yes, to die on the cross, but also to be our example, to demonstrate for us what it's all about and and. and, and, and well, what it's all about. He, he came to do it for us, to show us that it's possible. And you know what? Jesus takes this very seriously. Jesus takes this whole thing called Christianity, called being a disciple of his. Jesus takes this very seriously. I'm afraid at times much more seriously than we do. Jesus takes this whole thing e extremely seriously. In fact, he, he tells us some, some great and incredible things um, and what it really truly means to follow him. Wow. First thing we got to know and understand about, um, about Jesus as he demonstrated what it means to live worthy of the gospel is that he was God. See, he existed for all of eternity, always was God. Jesus was in the beginning. He created all things. Nothing was made that wasn't made through Jesus Christ. Never forget, never stop understanding that Jesus Christ always was God. Jesus always existed. He is eternal. Everything that is created became, became created. Jesus didn't. Jesus is God, always was. He always will be. He was God in, in heaven, being glorified, being exalted, and he left the glory of heaven, and he came down to the earth as a man in his external form. He never stopped being God. He was God, and he always will be God, but also for a while, approximately 33 years, he existed as God in human form. He was a God-man, the Son of Man. He was God, always existing in his eternal form. But then verse, verse 7, it says, he didn't, well, he didn't consider um, being equal with God or being God to be used for his own advantage. It's just proof of God's love for us. It's proof of, of God's eternal love and his grace and his mercy for us. And he didn't consider that something to be used for his own advantage. Wow. We're going to talk more about that here in just a minute. But verse 7, it says, Instead, he emptied himself by, by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the, the likeness of, of man. Jesus emptied himself. Now, not of his deity. He never stopped being God, so never confuse that. But he set aside his exaltation, his glory. He set that aside temporarily for a while so that he could then come down to the earth to demonstrate for us what it means to live worthy of the gospel, to demonstrate for us what it means to be a follower of his, and then to go to Calvary, then to go to the cross, then to lay his life down as the ransom and the propitiation, the payment for our sins forever. Jesus emptied himself and came down, not as God, not to smite evil and sin forever, but instead as the form of a slave, showing us and proving to us what it means to be united and humble, what it means to, to live worthy of the gospel. And then verse, verse 8, it says, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Wow even the, the death of the cross. 
Jesus didn't just simply demand that we be humble. He didn't just simply demand that we be united, together serving him. Jesus didn't sit with an iron rod and an iron fist and just tell us and command us how it is that we're to live and to, that we, if we want to be his, that we'd better act this certain way. Jesus came down and modeled it for us. He demonstrated it for us. He showed us that it is possible, that literally all things through him are possible. He showed us and demonstrated what it means to be humble because he humbled himself to the point of death. Jesus gave his life for you. Jesus laid his life down in a humble way. God himself gave his life for you. That's humility. That's humbleness. That's meekness proven before us. But the scripture doesn't stop there. He didn't only humble himself to death, but even the death on the cross. Now, you got to understand how brutal and embarrassing, how excruciating death on the cross was. It was the most horrific form of torture and death ever devised by mankind. It was not only painful, but it was also humiliating. They would strip a person naked and hang them up in a public place where they would hang there for days and days until they finally died of asphyxiation. They would give them water and sometimes food to prolong the agony. It was horrible. And our God came down and humbled himself to the point that he was willing to give his life for us, but not just give his life, but give his life in such a humble, public demonstration of his love for us on the cross, on Calvary. Jesus died a public death demonstrating what it means to be humble before all of us so that we can live our lives then worthy of him. That's a God-sized task. The first thing we've got to know and understand is that Jesus demonstrated for us what it means to live worthy of the gospel. The second thing is that Jesus desires it. Jesus desires that that we would live our lives in a way that is worthy of what he did for us. Jesus demonstrated what he's talking about here for us. He proved it. He showed it. He modeled it. He lived it. And what he wants is for us to do the same thing for him and for his glory. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, one of the most famous verses in all of Scripture, Jesus gives us a command that is absolutely mind-boggling when you really stop and think about it. He said to the disciples and to those that were with him, he said, anyone that wants to come with me, anyone that wants to come after me needs to humble himself, deny himself, and take up his cross daily and follow me. While the people that were with Jesus at that time didn't have a clue what he was really talking about, But we have the advantage of of, of the Scripture. We know what happened then. We know how Jesus went to the cross. We know that he was buried in the tomb. We know that he rose again on the third day. We know what he went through. And now he is calling you and I to to lay our lives down before him, to deny ourselves and to take up our own cross and to follow him daily. That's what it means to live worthy of the gospel. It means to just, to just say, God, it is no longer I who live, but you live inside of me. And now this life that I'm living in the flesh, I want to live by faith in you because you loved me and gave yourself for me. That's what it means to live worthy of the gospel. Jesus desires it. He desires his creation to set aside our own desires, our own wants, and to come after him with all of our heart, with everything that we have. That's what he desires. God in his sovereignty, he gave us free will. We can choose whether or not we want to do that. Some have chosen to, some have chosen no. Some have rejected the good news, some have accepted the good news. That's up to God, let him work it out. But those of us that have chosen to follow him is a high calling. It means that we have to empty ourselves, humble ourselves, lay ourselves down and say, really, really, God, it's not my will at all that needs to be done, but it is you and your will that needs done. That's what it means to lay down our our lives and to pick up our crosses and to follow after him. Jesus hates mediocrity. Jesus hates lukewarmness. He explains very clearly in Revelation what he would like to do to those that are lukewarm. 
Jesus doesn't have a whole lot of tolerance or patience for those that are kind of half in and, and kind of half out. Jesus didn't call us to somewhat surrender, to pick up our cross part way or, or every once in a while. Jesus commanded us and told us that if we want to follow him, we have to lay down everything and give him everything. Everything that we have. Jesus hates mediocrity. He would rather spew us out of his mouth. He would rather vomit us out if we are lukewarm. Choose which side you're going to live on and then stick with it. Jesus desires that we give him everything. Kyle Eidelman wrote a, wrote a book and has a Bible study out called Not a Fan. Wow, if you've never been through it, I think we're going to offer it here pretty soon. What he's talking about is that, that Jesus didn't call us to be fans of his. I believe the church in America is made up of lots and lots of fans. People that believe Jesus is a pretty good guy. People that believe Jesus is a pretty good teacher. And really, I kind of like Jesus. I'm, I'm really, I think I'm going to become a fan of his. And if they had a jersey with his name on it, and whatever number he would be, by the way, that'd be number one. <laughs> I'd wear that jersey because I'm a fan of Jesus. I go to church almost every week. And, and you know what? Jesus is, is a pretty cool guy. He didn't call us to be fans. He called us to be followers, which means laying aside everything that we have and saying, God, it's not my life anymore, but it's yours because you're living inside of me. Jesus demonstrated what it means to, to live worthy of the gospel, and then he also desires it. He desires it from you and I. The third thing that we have to know and understand to answer the question of why should we live worthy of the gospel is then the third thing is that Jesus deserves it. He's deserving of it. Look at verses 9 through 11. In verse 9 it says, For this reason, because of everything I've just mentioned, for this reason God has highly exalted Him and given Him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The third thing that we have to know is that, is that Jesus deserves it. He is the only one that deserves everything that we have. Jesus Christ is God, and He is the only one that deserves all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. Jesus is deserving of all of that, and He is the only one. He is the only thing in your life on this earth that is deserving of everything that we have. He is deserving of it. By the way, I mean, this is like one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. I know I say that every week, <laughs> and I mean it every week. But I really mean it today. This passage motivates me. This passage drives me. This truth and this reality of what Jesus has done and what God has done then because of what Jesus did, it drives my life. It motivates me. It makes me get up in the morning and put on my shoes and go out and do what God's called me to do, even when it's hard. Even when it's more than what I can do on my own. This passage motivates me to live worthy of the gospel. Jesus not only demanded it, he not only expects it, but he is deserving of it. He is totally deserving of all that you and I have to offer. He's deserving of it. Only he is worthy of our everything. People ask me all the time, as I, I imagine they ask you too sometimes when you're sharing your faith, People will say, well, why are there so many religions all over the earth? Why are there so many different things? If there's really one true God and Jesus is God and he did everything that he said he was going to do, why are there really, really all these different religions? And you know what? That's a big question. It would take a long time to try to answer that in a big way. But guess what? I've got a simple answer for you. Do you all want to know it? Isn't simple kind of nice? I'm a simple kind of a guy. I like to keep things just dirt simple. The low-hanging fruit where everybody can pick it, including myself. I like things simple. The simple answer to that question is really, there are only two kinds of religion in the world. There's only two. 
Well, wait a minute, Brother Kurt, there's Buddhism and and Hinduism and and universalism and all these things. No, there's really only two. There are two religions in the world. One religion says that there is a God somewhere or everywhere and that you can just only hope to try to be good enough to either become God or make that God happy and you just really have no hope and no way of knowing, so just try your best. That's one religion. That's all over the world. And then there's Christianity. And see, Christianity is markedly different because Christianity says that in no uncertain terms, Jesus Christ always was and always will be fully God. Jesus is God. And that our God not only talked about his love for us, but he proved his love for us. And that even while we were still in our sin, he came, left heaven, came down to the earth, humbled himself to the point of death, died on a cross and took our punishment that we deserved upon himself so that we don't ever have to be ashamed so that we don't have to face the wrath of God that he had to create because of man's rebellion against him and his ways. Jesus is deserving of everything that we have because of what he's done, because of who he is. Huh. Don't you just love that verse, Romans 5.8, if you're taking notes, that says God proved his love for us. See, I serve a God that doesn't just talk about his love. He proved it. And that even while we were enemies of his, even while we were still in our sin, he came and died for us. That should motivate us. That should drive us. That should cause us to give Jesus his worth and his worship, everything that we have. Wow. And then now, get this, it gets better. Now, because of what Jesus has done, God the Father has given Jesus the name that is above every name. That at that, the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What is that name that is above every name? That is the name Lord. Jesus has earned the name Lord, which gives him the right to rule and reign in our lives and on this earth now and forevermore. Jesus has earned it. He's earned the name that is above every single name. And by the way, the name of Jesus Christ is what the demons cannot stand in front of. The name of Jesus Christ is what moves mountains. It's the name of Jesus Christ that accomplishes God's will on this earth. Never, ever mess with the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Stand up for the name of Jesus. Do not let movies, television, or people blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ. He has been given the name that is above every single name. Never let anybody mess with the name of my Lord and Savior. By the way, as long as we're talking about the name of Jesus, don't you just love the name of Jesus? At the name of Jesus, the demons have to flee. They cannot stand at the name of Jesus. When we pray to the Father through the Holy Spirit because of Jesus and what he's done for us, when we pray in the name of Jesus for God's will, he will hear our prayers and he will answer our prayers. Never pray in any other name but the name of Jesus Christ. Don't pray in your name, your son's name, that name, some name. Pray in the name of Jesus. Never be ashamed of that name. Everything we do is because of Jesus, for Jesus, through Jesus, for his glory, because he has been given the name above every name. Wow. And one day, every single knee will bow of those in heaven. Now, those have already experienced forgiveness. They've experienced what faith and trust really is. And so they're already up there. They're already experiencing glory one day to be fully glorified. They're already up there worshiping Jesus now and forevermore. So they're already taken care of. And then those that are under the earth, they will do it also one day. They are already lost. They are already gone. They are out of our control. We can do nothing more for them. Those that have rebelled against God and rejected the love of Jesus, they are, they are going to be judged and sentenced forever, but one day they too will kneel and confess that Jesus is Lord, but then it says those also on the earth. Now that's our responsibility. We can't do anything about the ones in heaven, 
They're already there. We can't do anything about the ones under heaven. <laughs> They're already there. But there are those that are still on this earth, and that's our responsibility. Jesus has commanded us to take this good news of what he has done for us to them. That's what Mission Canton's all about. That's what, what we are here to do this next week. That's why we're wearing these shirts. That's why people take a week's vacation. That's why students come to some place they've never been before and they stay in a house they've never seen and they eat food that they have no control over, whatever. That's why they do all these things to tell people about Jesus, to tell people what God did for them, even though they rebelled and didn't believe in him, God still proved his love for us. That truth of what Jesus did drives and motivates them, motivates us to do what we're about to do this next week. It's too late for those above. It's too late for those under. But the ones right here, right now, it's our responsibility. It's your responsibility. You're the church you're placed right here at this time right now. Jesus commanded you to go out and make disciples. Right now, this whole confessing Jesus, bowing down before Him, confessing Him as Lord and Savior right now because of God's love and His grace, because of our free will right now, it's optional. Our God would never force Himself upon us. He would never hold us down and make us love Him. But he has given us a choice whether to choose him or to choose ourselves. Right now, this whole confessing Jesus and bowing before him is optional. But one day, it's going to be mandatory. One day, every single knee will bow and every single tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? To glorify him. Everything is for God's glory. <laughs> everything. Everything. It's to the glory of God. That's what this is all about. Why live worthy of the gospel? Why be unified when it's hard? Why be humble when it's hard? Because he's worthy. Because he is worthy of our everything. Because he has shown us what it looks like. He's proven to us. He's demonstrated it. And that he didn't consider himself too good to come down and do what he had to do to show us and to die for us. Wow. He's, he's demanding of it. He, he wants us to do it. He encourages us. He, he told us to give our whole lives to him. See, he gave his life for us, and he expects us to give our lives for him. And finally, he's deserving of it. Wow, he deserves everything that we have to offer. Paul kind of hammers us back in chapter 1, verse 27, when he says, oh yeah, by the way, live your lives in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. That's a tall order. But I think he's shown us here in these preceding verses and all that we've gone through these last couple of weeks what it really looks like, what it really means to live our lives worthy in the gospel. It's a God-sized task. It's more than we can ever do on our own. The only way we can do it is by surrendering control of our lives to the Holy Spirit and letting Him take over. The weaker we make ourselves, the stronger he can be in us and through us. That's how it's possible. I had the joy and the privilege um, just the other day, just about a week ago, to meet with some, some believers, to just kind of share with them and do life with them for a little while. And I just was overwhelmed as, as one of these new believers, as we shared about what Jesus was doing in our lives right now, what he's been doing, what he's been doing in this community, what he's been doing in this church, as we shared about what he had been doing in our families and the growth that we'd been experiencing personally, this one brand new believer just looked at me with tears in her eyes. And she said, the reality of what Jesus did for the cross did on the cross for me, I just, I just can't get over that. I just can't get over the truth that Jesus would die for me so that I can spend eternity with him. I, I, just, I just can't get over that. That's it right there in a nutshell. Why live worthy of the gospel? Because of what Jesus did on the cross for you and for I. So that we can have a relationship with him forever and ever. That's what it's all about. Live worthy of the gospel. He's worthy. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, boy, do I thank you for being our God. I thank you for loving us in spite of ourselves, 
And Father, I pray as we, as we prepare to embark on this incredible mission that we have going on this next week, I pray that you will do great and wonderful things in our lives and in this community. Father, I pray that you will take this truth that we have explored today and you will let it drive us and dictate every area of our life that everything we do, would be cu- would, we would do because of what you have done for us. Father, have your way with us. May you be glorified in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.